Today is a fun one. We're going to be talking about personas and role playing um, with two practitioners. And you might think like, okay, I, what does this have to do with activism? And uh, it's shown up in all kinds of activism, whether we think about the yes men who um, kind of play imposters, they act like they're from an oil company or a bank, um, and then get invited to conferences as representatives of those companies and then speak in that say what they think those companies should say. That's a form of role playing, right? I'm the CEO of this company. Um, there's also things that have been like entirely online. And I talk about this with our guests today. Um, there was a Twitter account for Devin Nunes's cow. Devin Nunes was like a MAGA Republican from California. Another account too called Devin Nunes's mom. And they would just tease him relentlessly in these very silly ways. Um, enough so he was so thin skinned that he tried to sue them both, but wasn't successful because no one could figure out who they were. Um, there's also this kind of persona and role playing that we do all the time, right? So you'll probably act differently around children uh, than you would around uh, your grandparents or um, different in a professional setting than you are on a Friday night with friends. We allow different parts of our personality to come forward in different um, situations. And that's something that we can take advantage of in our work doing artistic activism. So one thing I can think of is when we can take advantage of not kind of speaking in one voice all the time, whereas like the head of a company or um, usually people in power really can only speak through one voice. If you're a senator, you're, you're kind of always a senator and you're always speaking as a senator in public um, where we can kind of slip back and forth and go to satire, go sincere and move in those roles um, in a way that our opponent can't. And I think that is something to consider. The other thing is that people kind of like this. It's fun. Um, Margaret, who uh, Margaret McCarthy is one of our guests today, and she played the first female president of the United States from 2016 to 2020. And she talks about encountering people and saying like, hi, I'm the first female president of the United States. And once they understood that she was kind of joking around, like people loved playing along. And uh, Ian Madrigal, our other guest, you may have seen on the news, uh, played the Monopoly man, dressed up like the cartoon Monopoly man from the game and went to congressional hearings and sat behind the people testifying and kind of mugged and reacted as the Monopoly man. And that created this like fun image that people often wanted to share. So we've got uh, those kinds of contemporary roles, but this is like a very long historical thing. It's the background of theater. It, it's um, why people love professional wrestling. You know, um, we love to cheer for the the heroes, but we also love to cheer and boo the villains. Um, and we know they're playing a part, but it's like, it, that's what makes it fun. So we can bring elements of this into activism and it might seem difficult if you've never performed before, but we'll talk about that because again, we perform all the time. I'm performing right now. Um, so I'm happy to welcome Margaret McCarthy and Ian Madrigal, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Let's start by just like talking about what you two have done. And um, Margaret, you took on a character as the first female president of the United States after the 2016 election. Um, that, why, why did you decide to become the president? <laughs> well, uh, thanks, Steve. You know, it's, um, it's a good question. I'll, uh, I'll answer it in at least two ways. Uh, one, you know, I was riding my, my bike up a hill in San Francisco and I thought, what if we just had a different reality and in that reality, I was the president. And I just thought about that some more and I thought, M maybe. <laughs> and, you know, another answer is um, when I was in elementary school, like maybe first or second grade, we went on a, like a class trip to the school library 
and I picked out a, a book, you know, these books for kids, educational books about the presidents of the United States, where it has like a, a picture on one side and then like a little biography on the other side. I sat down and I like turned through the book and then I like finished the book. And then I went back to the library and I said, okay, now give me the one with all the girl presidents. And, uh, and she had to explain to me that they didn't have a book with all the girl presidents because there had not been any girl presidents. And I was shocked. I was so shocked that I went home and I told my mom because I thought she probably didn't know and she should know. And, uh, and my mom explained, you know, like, well, no, she, she's right, Margaret. Like, there's never been a woman's never been president. And, you know, I'm like six or seven years old. So I said, well, I guess I have to be president then. <laughs> For the seeds were planted early. <laughs> very early, very early. But uh, but I think, you know, to, to your question of like, why at this point in time, why instead of uh, waiting for a future election cycle, a, a question you should ask any candidate, right? Why you, why now? Um, and I think for me, a, a lot of the why now part had to do with, um, you know, not just, I was interested not just in like pure escapism, not just in like reality is bad and terrible and horrible. Let's let's run away, please. Um, yeah. But but trying to create like kind of a portal into a reality where other things were possible that didn't seem possible in this reality, but with the idea that we could kind of like bring some of them back, you know. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be fully separate. It would be there would be some form of, um, of reality bleeding that could happen and that that could be a way to have um, hope, which seemed extremely difficult at some points, um, and also fun, which seemed inaccessible at some points, um, and also to like keep an eye towards not just what we inevitably were going to need to fight against and react against and defend against, but also like the, the actual goals and dreams and hopes and aspirations that we were ideally working towards. So uh, you performed as the president for the full four years. You would make speeches, yeah. you would go to events. Um, were there, I know you wrote me a letter because I asked you <laughs> to write me a letter as the president. Um, <laughs> Uh, what, what other things did you end up doing? You know, um, I was thinking about this when you guys invited me to this talk and I was like, I did so many things. Um, so I did, uh, I have some, some props as a good theater kid. I like props. Um, one thing I did was we did a, you know, the pocket, pocket constitution, right? Yeah. So I was like, oh, everybody loves a pocket constitution, but the constitution is a really old document and it, it needs, it needs some work. So we did these constitution workshops. So this says the new United States constitution It has all the, articles and sections and amendments that you already know and love. Um, but then we did a workshop where you could just like write new ones. We just yeah. sat around as a group and we're like, I mean, it needs fixing. Like what else could we do here? And we just came up with some stuff and then I just typed it and printed it and included it, you know, and here we did things like, um, uh, we, uh, uh, extend everyone in the United States has the right to vote. That's, that's it. Uh, you know, oh, this yeah. stop putzing around with all these things. Um, I also had a little bee in my bonnet at the time about the role of the first lady. Um, so I, I, was, I was like, that's, that should be a paid position and it shouldn't be automatically accorded to the spouse of the president. That's really weird. Like if there, if it's a job that we want someone to do, you should apply for it and like get paid for it. It's, it's been this like weird piece of unpaid female ceremonial labor for a really long time. So we covered all kinds of things, but it's, it's, you know, ultimately no constitution is complete, right? So that we, you know, we had a little note about that at the end and then um, and then included some some pages at the back for additional amendments, you know? So just this idea that that, that it should be a working document. Um, I, did a, I did a ribbon cutting um, for an, an art exhibition, uh, got the big scissors out, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, basically just anytime somebody was having a thing and they said, you wanna do a thing? I'd say, yeah, let's, let's figure that out. <laughs> During the midterms, I sat in a window at this art space on Valencia Street in San Francisco, and I had a computer monitor that was like showing real time election results. And I was like, this is the Oval Office for a day. I had a sign that said the president is in and I was just like working on on my speech because the president has to give a speech after the midterm. So I was writing two speeches. One in case it was, uh, you know, the Democrats won, and one in case the Republicans won. Um, it was kind of, it was a very dramatic midterm uh, that year, as you guys probably remember. It started really early with like re Republican success, and uh, and it, so I was going to this election watch party where I was going to give the speech, and the mood was bad. It was tough, 
And then like right before I was going to give the speech, like several really good things came in, um, you know, that uh, amendment in Florida that extended voting rights to all these people who previously had their uh, right to vote taken away from them. And several other Georgia, some other good pieces in news. Anyway, um, so I did a lot of things. We can talk more about any of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that you like added to your constitution basically a suggestion box, you know? <laughs> Fill in. We don't need to treat it as this frozen document. Uh, yeah. Even originalists, right, should celebrate the fact that the originalists did not treat it as a frozen document. So it's it's weird that we've started to like museumify the constitution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Ian, you know, Margaret's um, showing what's possible. I think you were kind of showing, like using the character to show what's actually happening right now um, yeah. and, and to expose that. Can you talk about the, the Monopoly Man and how you, how, where the idea for that came from? And I know it's a good story, right? It, it all happened in a, very quickly. Yeah, it was not pre-planned really at all. <laughs> Um, basically at the time I was running a campaign, um, around economic justice issues, but specifically on this like very legalistic, like very hard to communicate to the public issue called forced arbitration. Really like most of the problem is in the name, honestly, but it's basically a corporate takeover of the court system. It's when you, you know, have to agree to these terms and conditions, tons of fine print, and they'll stick a clause in there that says that if something goes wrong, you know, say if Wells Fargo creates a fake account in your name, if Equifax breaches all your data, you can't take them to court and sue them. You have to go to this private arbitration system where they pick who decides the case and they pay for it. And it's very shady. Um, and so we were working on this issue and it was obviously very hard to communicate that to the public easily um, and also to, you know, make the stakes of it real, because most of us don't imagine that we're going to be suing anyone at any point in our lives until we like have to. Um, and we found that the most uh, effective way to communicate about the issue was to call it a get out of jail free card. So the Monopoly Man imagery kind of came naturally from that. We were planning this like very small event on the Hill um, one week. We were just going to, you know, drop some flyers off at Senate offices telling them to vote uh, against this bill that would have made things worse, basically. Um, and it just so happened that the week that we were going to do this, uh, there was a hearing on both the Wells Fargo scandal and the Equifax data breach. Um, and someone had suggested like, oh, you know, we hand out these flyers, maybe someone should dress as the Monopoly guy. And me naturally being the person who like doesn't get embarrassed by anything. I'm like, oh yeah, sure, I'll do that, whatever. Um, and then knowing these hearings were happening, I had been to, you know, several congressional hearings in many of my jobs around DC. And I've noticed a couple times that I've been like the floating pair of glasses over someone's shoulder, you know, like you're very aware when you're sitting in that audience that you're on national television and like, don't do anything, you know, that you don't want anyone to see. And so it just kind of like hit me in a moment. I'm like, wait, what if I like wanted to be on camera and what if I, you know, made use of the spectacle? And so um, I, in the span of, I don't know, a couple days did a bunch of research into like, what are the rules of what you can do in hearings and um, you know, how can I kind of skirt them? And so I found out that, you know, they basically can't do anything about hats because of religious exemptions. So you can wear a hat. Mm -hmm. um, they can't really mess with, for instance, fake facial hair because you never know when someone's wearing a toupee, right? Um, but really you can't like make noise and you can't wear signs or uh, hold signs. So I knew that my assignment was to basically just be like a silent film character <laughs> behind somebody and just see how much I could get away with. Um, and luckily ended up getting the spot immediately behind the CEO of Equifax's shoulder. And so the entire two and a half hour hearing is, is being asked all of these very complicated, you know, questions. Like no one is watching this hearing otherwise, right? Um, I'm just, you know, twirling my mustache and messing with my monocle and mugging for the camera. Um, and it just went like crazy viral. It was like on the Today Show and Fox News and like random things. It was huge and still is pretty huge on Reddit. Um, and, you know, that was the single most effective thing I did that entire two year campaign to raise the vi visibility of this issue. Um, but it was a lot of work. I think there was a, a huge potential that it could have just been like, you know, a funny gif that came out of this hearing. Um, but basically, anytime the camera was on me, I was mugging and doing funny things. And then anytime the camera was on the senators, I was on Twitter and I was like searching Monopoly Man, Monopoly Man. And every single person 
tweeting about it, I would be like, hello, I'm Monopoly Man. This is why I'm here. Like had everything kind of ready to go. And so, yeah, it ended up just, I got very lucky and every single uh, piece of news coverage that got out of it, you know, they'd ask me like, oh, how'd you get in? Why'd you pick the costume? And I'd be like, anyway, forced arbitration. <laughs> and so we ended up getting, I don't know, you know, tens of news articles all about our issues that we'd been struggling to get any coverage of before. That's great. Yeah, the news always loves to hear like about the heist story, you know, and it's, yeah. you got to keep redirecting it. Um, yeah, it. So uh, you're working in a big campaign. There's a lot of people um, usually in that kind of situation. There's some folks. It was that... actually just me. Oh, it was just you? <laughs> I, I had a coalition. Uh, you know, it was like a lot of people were 10 percent, 20 percent involved in it. I was the only full time person on that issue oh. in the country. So did you have side, a lot of like, autonomy? Did, like you have to, did you have to run the idea by people? Um, I did run it by my two supervisors at the time. And what's funny is they had mostly, mostly one of them had shut down any of my creative ideas in the past. And like, wasn't sure if she fully trusted my, uh -huh. uh, my insight into things. Um, but I think basically I pitched them the idea and they were like, whatever kid, have fun. You know, <laughs> like, I just don't think they thought anything would come of it. Um, and I think they got tired of shutting me down. So yeah. And then, you know, again, the rest is history. Like, I think they're still fundraising off of that. So is the lesson like persistence? Um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's persistence. I think the biggest thing is don't be afraid to embarrass yourself, you know, because the, the biggest feedback I got too, you know, I was m working mostly with like lawyers and policy wonks and, you know, all those kind of DC people. And the biggest feedback I got after was like, oh my God, I could never have done that. And I was like, why not? I put on a costume. I made some faces. Like, you know, I mean, I think there's something to be said for like comedic timing or whatever, but in general, I'm like, the biggest part was just not being afraid to do it. Did you find that the whole costume helped? Oh, I mean, definitely. It was, it like, it helped really get the message across without me having to say all the words. Obviously when I needed to tie it back to forced arbitration, I had to do that after the interviews, you know, but the general message of corporate greed and, you know, like corporations versus the little guy, all of that, you just see a photo of it and you know exactly what the issue is. And I think that's the power. It's like a living meme. But I imagine too, like every time I've done something like that, there's like a total terror that happens right before like just stomach churning, like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Right. Um, did you feel that sense of fear or, you know, and then just like power through it? That's what I always do is it's like overly commit so that I can, can't go back, you know? Um, yeah. But, uh, but it's because I know it's going to come up. Um, did that go away pretty immediately or? Um, yeah, I think I always, I always feel it before an action because especially when you're doing something on TV, you're just very aware that if I do this right, it will be great. If I do it wrong, it will follow me for the rest of my life. <laughs> like if I did something actually embarrassing, it would not be good, you know? Um, so there's that feeling of like hyper visibility that's always scary. But yeah, once I, I think within the first 20, 30 minutes, I get into character, I start having fun and then you just kind of get in the zone. But yeah. there's always some anxiety. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing you did it on your own. I always, like, bring a friend so that there's, like, someone else that I can kind of... Yeah, that would be a lot easier. I should probably do that. <laughs> yeah, it makes you more brave. There's, like, encouragement. Um, yeah, and well, you're, like, performing for your friend instead of just a face. Yeah, or, like, you don't want to let them down, you know? <laughs> be like, hey, I don't think I can do it. I got to go. Like, you can't do that, so <laughs> you have to keep yeah, going. It's like being in a band versus a solo performer. It's a lot harder. Yeah, 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 for sure. So Margaret, I'm gonna come back to you. <laughs> so um, your project had this, like, there were a lot of collaborative parts. You said you had other people help you amend the constitution. Um, you were attending these other events. Like, how did you think about collaboration and how other people could get involved? How did that change over the four years? Like, were there any things that you found more successful or learned along the way? Yeah, I was always really interested in it as a collaborative project, even though I think there's something that maybe doesn't um, necessarily make that obvious out the gate with like the name, like the first female president. It's like, 
it's about me, the first female president. But it's like, not, not really, right? Uh, or at least that's not as interesting to me as saying like, as the first female president, you know, I'm more interested in being this kind of keyhole into our ability to like make different things happen and like make different things possible and, and, and imagine them together. So, um, so one of the first things I did as president, I mean, I was the first president to govern from the, from the West coast, far from the center of power in DC, you know, where Ian is located. And I was like, I need to take advantage now, you know, in our, our COVID times, we're all used to technology and remote working and whatever, but we, we were prototyping a lot of that under my administration. And um, so it's like one of the, one of the first things that we can do is rather than just, you know, as, as I was, became president so unexpectedly, I, I didn't campaign, I wasn't on the ballot, like I wasn't, in, in many ways, I wasn't set up for success and I, I needed a lot of help out the gate. So I just, I open sourced the government. I said, anybody who's interested can um, can just become a part of my cabinet and, and please give me advice because I have limited expertise and it takes a lot to run a country. So uh, so I, I just got a lot of uh, interest, really interesting and cool people, some of whom had like a lot of expertise and some of whom were more enthusiasts in a given subject, but kind of anybody who put themselves forward and like had a good attitude about uh -huh. it. Um, I was willing to, to work with them. And um, I worked with some really cool people, people I already knew, people I met through friends, people I met through the internet, some of whom were and prefer to remain anonymous where I'm like, but you're, it's really cool that you worked on that project with me. Thanks. <laughs> oh, wow. Why did they want to be yeah. anonymous? Um, cause they have a, they have, or Wait, had at it, the though? time, I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, why did they want to be anonymous? Works. And um, what was the name? Why, <laughs> um, the, the name was a Nani must, um, and they, they, you know, people just, sometimes people have a job that doesn't understand that they could also be participating in, you know, helping run the country um, through the office of the first female president. Um, right. Maybe it's because their place of occupation doesn't think they have enough time in their schedule to devote uh -huh. time to both initiatives. Maybe it's there's a little bit of like an image thing. You know, some some organizations really don't like being perceived as partisan. Um, so there, there were a few that uh, uh, you can kind of if you go through the policies and you see which ones don't have names attributed, you can sort of start to think about like, well, who wrote those? It wasn't me. Um, because uh, I'm, I have other things to do. I'm the president. And uh, so, so like that was sort of my initial, well, actually that was my second initial collaborative offering because the first thing was to just get sworn in and have my inauguration happen in San Francisco. It all happened very quickly. And again, you know, not having the full White House logistics team in San Francisco, I really had to lean on the community that I already had and people I already knew. So, you know, I got a podium from my friend who worked at a bookshop and it's their podium that they use for book events. And I got a speaker and a microphone from my friend who uh, who biked them over because he does like bike parties with music, you know, and uh, and the White House photographer, again, located in DC, very short notice. So I have a friend who um, is an amazing professional photographer. Shout out to Rush Russell Edwards, everyone hire him, um, <laughs> who took pretty much all of, of the photos, all of the ones of the inauguration, certainly. Um, and, and so that was that was that came out of me just like, Calling in favors is kind of my middle name also. So like anybody who is my friend just sort of knows like it's a matter of time before like I text you or something being like, hey, can you do this thing? Here's this thing. Um, so that was sort of how it all got started. And then, yeah, open sourcing the government. And then just really like it was just not very interesting to me to think about it as a solo project, yeah. you know? I mean, leadership can be very isolating. I think, you know, a lot of presidents have talked about that before. Uh, and so you you want to be building a team that can help you be a better president and deliver better results for the country. So, you know, whenever I had the opportunity to uh, to collaborate with like different groups or uh, just whoever happened to happen to be there, um, I was really excited to do that because it also just brought more people into what was happening, right? Brought more people sort of through the portal. Yeah. Um, an, an interesting thing that I was reflecting on sort of towards the end was of the many, many times when um, somebody would say to me like, oh, what's going on? And I would say, hi, I'm Margaret McCarthy. I'm the president of the United States of America. Nice to meet you. No one ever said to me, no, you aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Not, hap not once, never happened. <laughs> what do their eyebrows say, though? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> why, um, why? Does everyone else know this is happening? <laughs> <laughs> How long is she going to shake my hand? <laughs> Am I going to be okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, Ian, yours wasn't like inherently collaborative. It's just you in the seat, right? Uh, performing, but I know you brought other things into it, but were there ways that you thought about how to get other people involved or encouraged it or supported that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've, I've given a lot of talks about this kind of stuff. Um, someone on Reddit, when I did my Ask Me Anything there, had coined it cosplay, like C-A-U-S-E. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. Um, and so, you know, I've tried to encourage a cosplay movement to kind of form uh, in the aftermath. I would say, honestly, a lot of the momentum got killed a little bit with COVID. Um, I was starting to kind of do more things with it. And then it was just, you know, for instance, like I haven't been to a congressional hearing since, even though they're having them in person again now, because I don't know, maybe I should get like a Monopoly Man mustache printed on a mask or something, but I wouldn't feel comfortable going in a place like that unmasked these days. So it's like made that kind of intervention a little bit harder. Um, but I have noticed a huge proliferation of the Monopoly Man um, character, whether it's like people actually dressing up in character or being used, you know, in uh, videos or graphic design or whatever it is. Um, and so it's been cool to see people take up the mantle. I've seen a lot of photos of people at local protests dressing up as the Monopoly Man. Um, and like you mentioned, other organizations going to congressional hearings in costume. I was very impressed by the Swamp Monster because again, like you're not allowed to wear masks. So the fact that they were in the hearing room as long as they were was pretty impressive. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love that people are pushing the envelope. I actually did um, an appearance at a Zuckerberg hearing where they ended up having him like totally cordoned off from the public because he's a coward. Um, but there were like, you know, there was me and then there were other people wearing kind of silly costume things. And I was like, wow, OK, like this is I've never been at a hearing that had other people dressed up. So it's been cool to see it kind of um, get into the culture. Uh, but I haven't systematized it like, you know, Margaret has done with some collaboration. I would definitely like to do more things like that. I don't know if Monopoly Man is necessarily the right character for that, but, um, you know, I think it would be fun. I also have a dream of like an army of Monopoly Men like going into a hearing. So it's just all Monopoly Men, <laughs> but that might be hard to pull off for a lot of reasons. <laughs> Can, can I just say, Ian, systematized is so kind. This was incredibly opportunistic. <laughs> Every, everything I'm talking about was incredibly are gonna opportunistic. Slap that, you know? <laughs> I think, um, I mean, for me, one of the biggest things, like I, uh, in part because, you know, I, I didn't run a campaign. I wasn't planning to be to be president. Um, also, four years is a long time, you guys. Sometimes you sign up for something and then you're like, oh, I'm still doing this. Like, <laughs> I, did, I didn't go in with this with a with a plan of like oh this is you know phase one of my administration first 90 days and then i'll work with this group and it was very it was very like opportunistic and kind of like see what pops up and, and see what's interested you know sometimes there were like things i wanted to do or like people i wanted to work with and it, it just didn't quite didn't quite pan out but um but, but a lot of the time just like putting the word out there you know then um people would say oh yeah margaret she's doing that president thing you should talk to her about this other thing that you're doing you know so you, you both sort of mentioned um, Ian, your supervisor sort of being like, okay, whatever. And Margaret, you know, people, when you introduce yourself as the uh, president of the United States, um, kindly not saying anything. <laughs> but, um, I think they would usually say, pleased, pleased to meet you, or it's an honor to meet you. And I would say, thank you. It's an honor to serve as your president. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's, I think, and we also just talked about like this courage that it takes to go through that initial sort of uh, anxiety or panic, whatever. Um, but it also the courage to like act foolish. And I think doing that in a persona certainly helps, right? It's not actually me, I'm playing a character. Um, but how do you get around the, the worry of, um, of acting foolish and having that reflect on you instead of the mm. character? Because I think a lot of people like Ian, you said it really well, which is like all these people thought it was great, but they thought I could never do that. And I've heard the same thing where it's like, hey, we could do this thing. And they're like, oh, that's I, it's great. But I am i can't do that kind of thing. I can't perform like that. You know, I also like it's actually funny because the people that knew me in D.C. or knew me in law school before that, like I think they were all very surprised when I did Monopoly Man. But people who knew me in high school were like, oh, of course, like. <laughs> This is where your life has led, you know? So, like, I have kind of always been like this. I mean, I didn't really wear costumes in high school, but I would make an ass out of myself on the regular on a regular basis, especially if it was, like, 
you know, going against the administration or whatever it was. Um, so it's, it was never a struggle for me, but I think honestly, for a lot of people, it's that initial hurdle. It's that they've never done anything like that. Um, and if you can get them to try something, even if it's small once, I find a lot of people really find it intoxicating and empowering and, you know, bringing it back to drag. I don't know if you've, you know, seen the episodes of like RuPaul's Drag Race where they'll have a random like cis straight man and the drag queens will make them over afterward they're always like oh my god like I love that you know and I think it's just like so many people don't realize how fun it is to perform and we don't have you know a culture that appreciates art or appreciates theater um, and so I think if you don't see yourself as an artist or as a performer you just never even go there but I think for a lot of people when they try it even if they try it as like you know I'm one of a hundred people like holding a mask over my face. I'm not really doing anything. Like they can kind of start to see what is compelling about it and what makes you feel so powerful. What do you think, Margaret? Yeah, I think um, it, it, it brings up a few things for me. I, I mean, I think like Ian, like I've always kind of been a ham. And so that, that fear and, and a theater, theater performer. And so that, that fear is not, as present for me as, as I know it is for some other perfectly reasonable humans. Um, but, but I would say a couple things. One, you know, for me, for the first female president, like I was playing a very close version of myself. It mm -hmm. was the, the difference between me and the first female president is vanishingly small. One might say it is the fact that one of us is the president, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and that was, like I have a degree in in playing other people like I like doing that um but for this project I was like no this is just me it's just that also I'm the president and and I would say like if if you're somebody who you're you know watching this or thinking about this and you're like I cannot imagine going around telling people I'm the first female president okay don't like but what can you imagine yourself doing like pick something that's closer to you you know what I mean? So like part of why I think this project worked for me was because I was playing to my strengths, <laughs> like <laughs> things I have experience in. I used to be a competitive public speaker. Like I'm very, very comfortable in that kind of forum. Um, I've had a lot of public facing leadership positions like at very um, excellent organizations that I've been grateful to work at. Uh, I'm used to that kind of, and that was a lot of what I was thinking about actually in the inspiration for the project was like, you know, what is the, the ceremonial role of the president? Like, what is, what do we look to this person to do? And I was like, a lot of what most, most of us don't understand what the president does on a day-to-day -day basis or week-to-week -week basis or month-to-month -month basis, where we usually key in are things like speaking opportunities, right? We understand what the president is saying to us um, at, a, at given points in time. And so when I sort of distilled it down to the, the aspects that I thought were interesting to kind of play with. And again, like th things that matched what I was already interested in and like comfortable with, that was kind of a lot of how I, how I built the project actually. And so I think if you're thinking about like a, a persona or a character, there's at least two ways. Like one, like a mask is incredibly freeing and you can like get your freak on in ways that you did not know you could unlock before you put that on. And I want that for everyone, try it. And Another non-contradictory um, path is just like be a slightly different version of yourself, you know, just enough different that you feel like you know what's happening and, and you can tell the difference when you go to sleep at night. But um, but it doesn't have to be a stretch. You can think of you can build it around your natural ways of being and and skills and interests. So that's a great point. And, and like I was Ian, when you were talking about law school, like. I've only heard about law school, but um, from what I understand, there is like a performance part and that that sometimes can be taught. Like, you know, giving a closing argument in a trial is partly performative. And uh, Margaret, like you leading nonprofits, like you have to, you have to present as an authority, you have to talk to um, powerful people either that are allies or funders or you know, government folks. Not allies. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and kind of like act like you're a serious person, you know? Um, and so we all do that. Um, and I'm, you know, both of you have, I'm, Ian, I'm assuming there's some training either in law school or experience, right? Like for me, I was a, I was a high school teacher 
which like involved a ton of like acting like an authority. Cause if you, if you don't do that stuff, like uh, one of the rules of thumb was like, don't smile until October or no, December, don't smile until December. Cause like the, you start as this authority and you end up as their friend. But if you start as their friend, you end up as a punching bag, you know, um, it, it just, it's going to devolve no matter what. So you got to start at this like authority thing. But you can do things like just hold up your hand and stare at people and they'll all stop talking, you know, and like, but if you like don't act confident, it does not work. And so that and then also I was I was a undercover security agent and I and I was like, like not I arrested people as a citizen. And wow. to do that, also, you have to present a tremendous amount of confidence and hold up a badge and a star that we just bought from a catalog, you know. Like, and I was like, when they handed it to me, I'm like, this is fake. And they're like, no, no, it's not fake. It's like, it's meant to like show people so that they react. Then they kind of submit, right? <laughs> the whole thing wow. is you show them the badge and you're like, I need to talk to you. I was arresting shoplifters for the most part. And uh, like hold up the badge and you say, I need to talk to you about what you did in the store. And then if you do that in a confident enough way and hold the thing up and look them right in the eye, often, most of the time people just go, because they know that they did it and they know they're caught, their shoulders drop, and then it's easy after that, right? But if you're like, hey, I saw what you did, and um, oh, by the way, I'm security, and like, here's my badge, and fumbling with it, like, they're going to walk away, you know? Or worst case, like, you're in a situation where someone might, it might get, like, they might react in a way you don't know, and it could be dangerous, right? So those experiences, like, and I, uh, mine are, ex are more extreme, <laughs> you know, but I think everybody has that of like, in one place or another, you have to learn how to perform. And it's like tapping into that, right? So Ian, like, is that true about law school? Do like, they teach you performing? What were the other parts in your life where you were taught how to perform in that way that are more every day? Yeah, I would say in law school, it depends on what classes you're taking. If you're planning to be like a trial attorney or, you know, you're doing mock trial, you're probably doing that. I didn't do any of that stuff. <laughs> so I kind of always knew I wasn't going to be an attorney attorney. It turns uh -huh. out I was definitely far less of one than I planned to be. Um, <laughs> but I would actually say that law school was a big learning curve for me in terms of performance. Because for me, the biggest thing from law school was learning how to be a professional. Like, I didn't have that background in my family. And like, you know, it was such a fish out of water experience to be in this place where it was a lot of you know the children of the elite uh even though i went to like a public law school it was a totally different world for me um and so kind of figuring out how to relate to people and then of course applying for jobs and things like that the legal profession takes itself far too seriously and that's obviously not the thing that i naturally do so that was a big learning curve i did a little bit of theater in like elementary school. I actually didn't really have the traditional theater kid experience, even though looking back, I probably should have done more of that. Um, but I would actually say one of the biggest influences for me in that area was my sister. She was also like very fearless in that sense and would like, you know, sneak backstage places, like always kind of be like doing things she wasn't supposed to do. And she would bring me along. And so I started to do those things like for a long time, Anytime I would go to a concert with a musician I liked, I would just sneak backstage afterward and like go talk to them, you know? And so all of that stuff is completely confidence based. I, I had a whole yeah. thing where I, I was an Ani DeFranco concert and I was um, trying to get backstage and people were kind of like, who are you? Why are you here? And I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm waiting for my boyfriend. He's like working and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, and you just like have to have a story ready, like why you're there and you just don't act afraid. I actually also um, t walked in and became an extra on Parks and Recreation because they were filming on campus. And like my friend and I snuck in and we sat with all the other extras. And at one point they actually sniffed us out because my friend kept being like, oh my God, can you believe we're here? And I'm like, shh, quiet. <laughs> you don't want them to know. And the uh, producer came over to us and was like, hey, like, you know, are you guys union or non-union? Which is like the tricky way of trying to sniff you out. And I was like, oh, we're union. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. And they walked away. But you just, it's the confidence. They're trying to trip you up. You don't show I would the have said non-union. What a mistake. It's always union. The answer is always union. If it's a big production, they cannot get caught with anyone that's not in the union. You got to know that stuff. 
I didn't know that there were union background actors. Oh, yeah. Everyone's union in Hollywood. The other thing I was thinking about is there's, um, like, Margaret, you were saying that you do this, you've done this performing, and it's not, like, you're a lot more comfortable with it. And I think um, as I've done this stuff over time, like like that sense of um, fear is a is also familiar, right? And I'm like, oh, here it is, and and then you kind of like you know it's coming and you feel it, and then you can kind of channel it into excitement. Were there any other things that you all learned about doing this over time um, that became more familiar, that made it easier, that would help someone that was like maybe getting started? People really want to do the thing with you. Mm. It was a thing that just kept that kept being true. Um, I would think like they wanted to play along. They wanted to play along. They wanted to have fun. They wanted you to do it so that they could do it too. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was because I I would you know in the dark of the night right sometimes be like is this getting tired you guys right and um, <laughs> and. Um, I'm thinking about this, um, like the last, like really big rally thing that I did um, was uh, was outside a museum in San Francisco, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, um, and it was, uh, you know, all kinds of um, horrible things were were happening around family separation and just just the the absolute worst uh, uh, continuations of already very bad U.S. immigration policy and. Um, so I had been like talking with people and like trying to imagine the like what is the what is the utopian opposite and so we came up with this policy of 100% open immigration and I was like that's it we're gonna print it on a banner I tried to get the museum to hang it like over their name which reasonably they were like we're not gonna do that Margaret but um, <laughs> but I got them to have it like in a big public forum and. Um, and, you know, and I invited people to speak and I was like, we're gonna have a press conference announcing this new policy. Like, obviously we abolished ICE, that's easy, but we also like, you know, changed US customs and border protection to US customs and border elimination. Um, I made, uh, we made like informational pamphlets. It's not the government if there's not a brochure, right? So, you know, so we have like information for people about that. We have stickers, we have posters. Um, and I'm bringing this up because what, I, I was initially like sort of uh, leaning back from like doing another kind of like rally speechy thing. I was like, oh, you know, I should do something different. But then the more and more I talked to people, I was like, no, like this is a this is another just like window in to a world where we all get to sit for a while and think about um, what it would be like if this were true, mm -hmm. you know. And so, and, and then, and then having this format of like a press conference allowed me to like invite other people to speak again, so that it's like not just me talking, right? And uh, and just have like really different kinds of things. We had a band, um, we had like <laughs> just really kinds of different things happen to to create this world where where that was what was going on. Um, and and like the mood afterwards was like we had all just like had a party and like had a cocktail, like we all just felt great. You know, nice. and um, and and so I think that was what would help me when I was like, oh, is this getting repetitive, or is that you know, is this getting to be too much of the Margaret show? It was like, well, it's you know, I'm I'm just like the, I'm just the door. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're creating a moment, you have, mm -hmm. and you can craft some of it, and then people come in. Like you're not the only one improvising basically. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. then people are all talking about 100% open immigration and like what that would be like, what it would change for them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Ian, was there anything that you learned over time? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, Margaret's point is great that there's power in numbers. I think a lot of times so they need like a leader to start it off, but then it's a lot easier for people to come in when, you know, that space is already set and knowing that they're not the only person doing it. Um, I mean, I think that's where I didn't really get to go as Monopoly Man was like building that army. Um, but I think that's still something I would like to do in the future, whether it's Monopoly Man or something else, like giving people permission to participate. Um, but I think for me, it's funny, Margaret, that you actually brought up the child separation policy, because the thing I'm probably second best known for is um, shaming Kirsten Nielsen, Trump's DHS secretary out of a Mexican restaurant in D.C., like a couple of days after the um, the child separation policy broke, 
And I remember going into that. It was also very nerve wracking. A friend of mine had been eating in the same restaurant and like texted me and was like, can you get here? Like, can you get people? And so, you know, I'm posting on Twitter or whatever. I'm like, I literally was on the Metro home from my office and I like turned around and went back downtown. Um, but for a while I was the only person standing outside this restaurant and I had no idea, you know, like, is she about to finish her meal? Is she just starting her meal? Like how much time do I have? And I was like, okay, am I just going to go in there by myself and like somehow confront her and, you know, doing it as me too, was definitely more nerve wracking. So I got really nervous um, and luckily then some folks from the local DSA chapter showed up and it was great. But, um, when I was contemplating doing it by myself and it was terrifying and, you know, I was like, am I going to get arrested? My biggest thing was like, I had such a clear purpose in doing it, like being so motivated by the outrage over the child separation policy that it kind of pushed all those things back. So I would say one of the biggest things is just making sure that your purpose is really, really clear. You know why you're there, you know what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. And even though you might mess it up, because I was like, you know, this could end up being a viral video where it's like, look at this ridiculous protester doing something silly. Or, you know, even even uh, if I had mostly done what I wanted, I'm like, what if I don't have talking points? Like, what if I say the wrong thing? I'm not a specialist in, you know, immigration or the child separation policy. And so there was a lot of, I had a lot of nerves if it was going to blow back on me in some way. But again, it was just like, well, if that happens, like it's so much, the stakes are so much lower than the stakes for these kids that are in these um, detention centers. And so I think like having all of that ready, you're not just doing it for, you know, a paycheck. You're not just doing it for um, a cause that you're like kind of on the fence about. You have to be doing this around issues that you're passionate about. Um, and then the third piece of advice I think is, you know, the first Monopoly Man was very <laughs> like random and like I really had no idea it was even going to happen until the morning that it happened. Um, but since then, I've tried to do a lot more preparation. And so I've, you know, created my materials for the press and all that beforehand. I usually have some talking points. I might have some people backing me up on social media, whatever it is. Um, and I think like having a certain level of preparation can really ease those nerves just to know, like, I'm not going to just go out there and say whatever comes to mind. I at least have some ideas of what I might talk about or what I might do, the kind of gags I might do um, as Monopoly Man. But then also knowing that once you've prepared, you've prepared and you just have to trust that it's going to happen. <laughs> and um, if you prepare enough, you know, most likely even the stuff that you have to improvise will be good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've, so many interviews I've done, it's like the night before, I'm just like doing it over and over and over and again in my head. And the risk is like, uh, and this has happened, where like I come up with some joke and I'm like, ooh, that is that is a tough joke, you know? <laughs> and then accidentally blurt it out the next day. Um, <laughs> it's hard to get it out of your head later. But um, uh, as the Monopoly man, like, you know, Margaret was talking about these policies, like 100% open immigration and things that, you know, your your character and who you are, are pretty well aligned. As a Monopoly man, you're probably for Monopolies, right? And yeah. um, and have a, an entirely different, more satirical policy position. And what you're saying too, the army, it reminds me of uh, Billionaires for Bush, which was like, you know, a couple decades ago now, but when Bush was running for president, there was chapters of billionaires quote unquote billionaires for Bush that would dress up like, you know, in ball gowns and um, with champagne glasses and look like, you know, yeah. that, that yachting cap and a double breasted blue jacket and a, you know, ascot and um, complain uh, about things or talk about what they wanted. Um, and it's really like, you know, I think to most people, it's clearly a joke uh, and, that, and it's satire, but it often sometimes like if you feel really strongly about an issue, saying the opposite of what you mean, it's kind of hard. And I think people are reluctant to do it. Um, how do you find that like, okay, I'm in this costume, I'm the Monopoly man, like I'm going to say these ridiculous things, that that makes it easier? Or I mean, obviously it does, but do you still have a hard time? Um, I definitely trip up sometimes. I was actually doing an action last night and I was like, you know, we've been working to pass these bills. I'm like, oh, wait, no, I'm opposing the bill. Um, <laughs> yeah, that. But the good thing is, I think when you're in character, when you're making fun of someone in character, if you mess up and say something that's not, you know, very well put, or maybe even the opposite of what you're trying to say, it reflects badly on the character, you know, 
It's like, there's tons of stuff I say as Monopoly Man where I'm like, oh, that joke was like pretty bad. And I'm like, well, Monopoly Man, he's not actually very funny. Like, that's fine, you know? (laughs) Um, So it it does kind of free me up a little bit. I would definitely like, and most of any remarks that I make as Monopoly Man, unless they're in like a recorded video, are pretty much all improv. And so that can be really nerve wracking, but it's way less nerve wracking to do it as Monopoly Man than if I were to be like an improv comedian on a, you know, bullhorn or something. So that kind of provides a little bit of a safety net, but I don't know. I think it's really fun to mock authority figures and mock like people that you don't like, especially like, you know, someone like a billionaire, it's like, there's no redeeming qualities here. I'm not worried about towing a certain line or whatever. So I think there's a lot of freedom in that when you really feel comfortable, you know, you're totally punching up and you know that, you know, these people deserve all of the ire that they get. Well, I, yours too is like cartoonish, you know? So being kind of over the top, that's fun. And it means you have to be less careful about what yes. you're saying. Margaret, you're like less cartoonish, yeah. right? Like you kind of play it straight, right? Would you say so? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's to me, that for that, that's, you know, one of the differences, right? Is like in, in my project, like, it's much more funny for me to just say I'm the president and, and yeah. like move on, right? No, no, and so like, yeah. you know, I, I think, um, uh, so when I was working on this project, like very early days, um, just, just to give a shout out where it's due, um, I had talked with the Center for Artistic Activism because they put out in their newsletter, they said like, oh, if anybody's working on any sort of project, like in response to the 2016 election, like we're having office hours, you know, talk to us. And I was like, oh, thank God, because I have to talk to someone about this. I can't, I can't tell if this, if this idea makes any sense to anyone else. And I like bounced it off a couple of friends and, um, and we talked about it and, and we talked about like the parameters and like what the character, you know, and you guys were asking me like, well, would you wear would you wear a wig? And I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, and it was very clear to me out the gate that like, it was me, Yeah. you know, that the president was me and it wasn't me in a wig. It wasn't, you know, me with, with the mustache. Right. Even though again, like Matt, like that's, there's nothing, it's, it's just a different path. Right. And the, so the path for this character for me was always just like, oh yeah, it's Margaret. And also now she's the president. And, um, So, yeah, so I guess in terms of like playing it straight, I just found that that like, that was where the humor was, you know, and that was where people like, you know, because then it would happen like after you I've been doing it for a little bit, right, then you get into the situation where like you're at the farmer's market or whatever, right, and you're talking to your friend and then their friend comes up and they're like, oh, yeah, this is Margaret. She's, you know, she's the president, right? And you get to just roll out the whole bit. I had, um, (laughs) I printed uh, business cards. You know, because yeah, the president yeah. obviously walks around with with business cards, handing them out to people. <laughs> but just as another way for people, because then people will always take a card. You know, like people will always take a card. So you like you should introduce yourself, Mark McCarthy, forty um, fifth president of the United States, sized an honor to serve. You know, and they're like, uh huh, and they're sort of still processing. And then you're like, here, take my card. You know, it's always such a pleasure to get to meet engaged citizens like yourself. If you have any questions? You know, always looking for feedback on how we're doing as a nation. And they're like uh-huh right so it's like so the i felt like the more i just played it straight like it's san francisco is a city but it's also kind of a small town like you meet all the local politicians anyway so like that's that to me is like kind of a thing that's sort of baked in so it's like okay i'd just become the local president in a way Did, i don't know if i had told you too about this before but there was a city council or county council meeting in seattle where i went as like a far right person to testify I never told either of you about this. No. <laughs> so we didn't publicize it because because uh, we weren't lobbying, but we didn't want to be attacked for lobbying because we we're a nonprofit. Um, and so we just it it got done what it needed to get done in the meeting, uh, like some votes flipped. But uh, I was like wearing a camouflage jacket and a USA T-shirt and um, and I got a knockoff. MAGA hat, but it didn't come in time. But like that outfit, like I transform into an asshole. Um, And (laughs) I was testifying um, as in that character as like, hey, I think you guys on the Seattle Council are like, great. I just don't think you're going far enough because they were like, had this very kind of right wing 
position about drug policy, but they perceive themselves as very left, right? Um, anyway, I had to do it super straight faced and talk about how they need to get rid of like cabs because every night people go to bars and parties and they they're able to get home safely because of these cabs. And like, when are they going to learn their lesson? And people only decide to clean up once they've hit rock bottom. And so what, you know, if they're going to hit a tree, they're going to hit a tree and, you know, like that kind of thing. And, and that we needed to get rid of all the lifeguards. Otherwise kids are never going to learn to swim and like stuff like that. You like take away all the, the safety stuff. Um, Cause that's what they were doing with, about drug policy there. And, um, and yeah, the challenge was not laughing and getting through it all. And also just feeling so uncomfortable <laughs> about how I looked and, um, and how, like the other people there that were testifying that were like on my side, but I hadn't met yet. And then like, I went to them after and I'm like, Hey, just so you know, I don't normally dress like this. Like by the time I was done, it was clear what I was doing. The challenge of like keeping the straight face when you need to, um, not breaking from the character. Um, is it just like discipline? Um, cause I don't even know that I did it all that successfully. <laughs> Well, I mean, I would say for Monopoly Man, one of the beautiful parts of it is that if I do break from character, you know, you can like laugh at yourself and then like move on. It's not that important that I completely stay in character. And right. Can, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, it's kind of like when you're watching SNL and the character or the actors break, like that's almost funnier. So I don't worry too much about it. Um, but, you know, when I'm mugging behind these CEOs and hearings for two and a half hours, like, it gets tiring. <laughs> I have to try to keep both keep in character and also like come up with new things to do. Even though I've done so many of these hearings, there's really only so many like sight gags that you can do in hours long hearings. Um, and also like think, maintain the focus on what they're saying and, and reacting. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing too. Like that's actually probably the harder part of Monopoly Man for me is like, I have to pay attention because mostly I'm trying to get attention on what I consider to be the important bits of the hearing. So it'll be like, oh, there's a juicy question from a senator I like. Let me really like do a funny gag now so that people watch this part of the hearing, you know? So I'm like really paying attention too. Um, and then trying not to zone out when it's really boring, which happens a lot. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know. I think it's just really like commitment to the bit, you know? You got to believe in what you're doing. And um it's really just like the focus and, you know, knowing again, like what you're doing it for. Yeah. And Margaret, like you, it sounds like you sort of practice at parties. Well, I just sort of, I was like, I was constantly practicing. It was very improvisatory presidency in many ways. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I think commit to the bit is like always good advice. And, uh, and, and I would say right alongside it, like if you're not having fun, nobody else is going to have any fun, you know? And, and if you are having fun, like people want to be where the party is, like that's the yeah. universal human impulse. Like, you know, uh, so, so if you're having fun doing the, the thing, even if you're like a little bit scared or a little bit nervous, you know, but, um, and also like bring your friends to stuff, like definitely like who is the crowd of dozens who attended my inauguration, dozens, it's a very large crowd. Some say the largest. Um, uh, <laughs> definitely. You know, <laughs> They're, like they were mostly people who already knew me. They, they, were there some people walking by San Francisco City Hall that day who stopped and said, what's happening? Yes, there were. Yes, there were. But uh, most of the people who were there were there because they, they'd been drawn into like the Margaret universe at some point and because they wanted to do something fun, you know? And so also like, like having that be your vibe of like, it's okay. You know, I think sometimes, I, and, and I absolutely can feel it too, but this like, oh, well, like, if I'm doing this, like, my friends, like, no, like, this is for, you know, national, audit. like, you start with, like, the front, I'm gonna be on the front page of the New York Times, like, that's really hard. That's a really hard yeah. place to start. Like, what if you just start with, like, I'm gonna do the thing, you know, and then see where it goes from there, right? So, like, what are the things you have to do to just do the thing, to just, like, make it happen, like, reduce all of the um, pressure to have it end up in this other place? Um, and so then you can just focus on like doing the thing and like making it fun and having a good time and like everybody having a good time and then just like take, like letting it grow from there. Um, I had two more questions. 
You guys are great. Um, so Ian, like the impact on yours is you can kind of measure in some ways because there were news stories about this issue that wasn't getting coverage before, even with the Kristen Nielsen thing, like, um, I mean, there was blowback, if I remember right, there were people like, is this the proper way to protest, which always comes up when something actually makes a difference. Um, but people don't remember that. They remember Trump's terrible policy and that she was part of it. Yeah. Um, and so in that way, you can say that it worked um, or that, you know, even that you got the seat there and the, a single photo in a way is effective. Were there other things that you found effective and like Margaret too, for you, like it's far more abstract. Um, and how did you sort of like, what were the moments where you're like, wow, this is working, you know? Well, kind of building on what Margaret was saying, you know, one of the successes of the first Monopoly Man for me was just how much people enjoyed it, you know, like it, people really, and I think actually one of the reasons that Monopoly Man even went as viral as it was, was that we just hit at the exact right time. Like I've done enough of these, especially since, you know, trying to do other Monopoly Men things and whatever, and being like, oh, this is so much better than the original, like it's got to work. And then it doesn't like viral stuff naturally just you can't predict it and there's a lot of factors that you can't control um but i think one reason the first one was so successful was it was actually the week of the las vegas shooting um and you know there was also i forget exactly what trump stuff was happening at the same time but it was like a really 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 depressing news week in the first year of trump's presidency and so i think what worked is that people saw this thought it was funny, thought it, you know, like it was this kind of bright part of their day of like, oh, the CEO is getting embarrassed. Congress is kind of being made fun of. And it also really kind of weirdly struck a bipartisan note, because even if, you know, your politics, your views on economics are actually pretty pro-billionaire, most people don't think of themselves as pro-billionaire or pro-corporate at least. Um, and so, yeah, it, I just found it successful that it kind of brightened people's days. Um, and I think that's the beauty of a lot of this creative activism and, you know, the, the fun stuff, like Margaret was saying, as opposed to, you know, always like kind of an angry protest, like those have their place. And there was a reason that I kind of took the angry tack when it came to Kirsten Nielsen. Um, but I think there's a lot more room for joyful protest and showing people how to push back in ways that are fun and funny and, you know, can connect us instead of kind of doing us versus them thing. Um, so that itself was a success. Um, I would also say for the Kirsten Nielsen one, I think what was really effective was channeling the national mood. You know, there was so much outrage over these policies. It was really pretty universal, again, like kind of bipartisan, which was rare um, and increasingly rare. Um, but I think a big thing was that people were outraged by the policies, but they didn't know what to do. You know, there were some protests and things like that, but that was a point where like we were protesting every weekend, some new Trump thing. So it didn't really feel like it was going to be really impactful. And I think taking it directly to her, even if it didn't change the policy was empowering to people. And also, you know, it kind of launched a lot of people and, you know, you know, confronting different Trump officials in different capacities um, and different politicians, I think it kind of gave people permission of like, oh yeah, I normally wouldn't harass someone in a restaurant, but when these are the stakes, like now the calculus has changed. And so it's like letting people kind of see themselves in the action that you're doing, and then also hopefully put themselves in the place going forward and actually, you know, doing something they maybe never thought they could do because they saw you set the example. Great. That's such a beautiful way to put it, Ian. Um, I think, yeah, you know, the, the, the impact of this project is, um, I, I think you said abstract, Steve, amorphous could be another way to describe it. I think, uh, there's a challenge with portals, right? Is, you know, they're not bound by time or geography or anything that's sort of like easy, easy to pin down in that way. And, and it was a question I found myself asking, like often during the four years of my administration, on the one hand, you know, you do your best to pass all these pass all these policies and make all these things happen, but um, can always be undone by a subsequent administration as, we, as we've seen so many times. Um, and uh, so, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a project that was setting out to say like, 
um, X is the case and we want it to be Y and our success success conditions will be when we have achieved Y. And that yeah. is um, how a lot of very important work is done. So I'm not here to criticize that by, by any means. Um, but what I, what I was setting out to do with it, you know, really was, um, was to, again, just have this kind of uh, space to, to continue to imagine, like I was thinking a lot about the, the um, you know, I was in college for most of the uh, George W. Bush, like Iraq war, um, all these kinds of things. And uh, just thinking about how much of the conversation that I, that at least that I experienced, like as, you know, a fairly young person, like interested in the world and the U S at the time. And like, what are we doing was, was very like reactive, like this is happening and we, we don't want it to happen. Right. Um, and I just felt like we were going to spend, uh, you know, coming off of eight years of a democratic administration that did it achieve everything we wanted to achieve. Of course not, not even close. Right. But instead of getting to have that conversation about all the work that was left to be done and the things that we wanted, um, that we were going to spend who knows how long, um, just like, like fighting the evils of this new administration. And I thought like, we have to have, a a space and a home for the dreams and for the world that we want to create. Like we can't spend all our time thinking about the world that we don't want to create and the nightmares we're trying not to have. Like we, we have to do both. We have to do both. But I was really trying to, um, to make sure that in the midst of all of the, the vital um, defensive work that needed to happen, that we could have um, this kind of like uh, utopian dreamland of, um, that went so much further than than anything that we've actually experienced in our lives in this country. Yeah, when you were saying X and Y, you know, I'm like thinking of this and like what you're doing is on this Z axis of like in another dimension. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the work that we're missing though. I think like we really need the visioning for the future and just the imagination um, in our activism because you're right, like it's been so defensive. And I think in a lot of ways, a lot of people were kind of complacent in the Obama years because mm -hmm. it like in him even being president felt like so beyond what was imaginable before that. I think a lot of people myself included kind of calmed down a little bit in pushing more. Um, and mm -hmm. then of course we end up with Trump and you're like, Oh God, now we're defending these like very piecemeal things that we accomplished instead of actually moving forward. But I think that's one of the biggest things we struggle with as a society is being able to actually envision what is better and break out of these kind of, you know, lesser evil choices that we often mm -hmm. end up with. I think we see it today still with, um, you know, legislation around uh, reproduction, just being like one example, right? Like it's, it's just been a defensive battle for, for so long in the, in the public imagination. It was like wearing the mask, commitment to the bit also, you know, frees you to critique institutions you might otherwise have to interact with. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's a safety for them too, right? Of like, yeah, for nobody sure. really knows who they are because it's a liability. So Devin Nunes, the Republican who now is running Truth Social, um, was trying to sue Twitter because there was a parody account called Devin Nunes's cow uh, that would tweet at him and insult him uh, in these like very silly ways. Like you are utterly ridiculous, you know, UDD. Wow. And, um, and they tried to sue there was a Twitter account for Devin Nunez's cow and Devin Nunez's mom that would antagonize him. And he tried to sue both of them, but no one could find out who they were. <laughs> and so they never got served. So yeah, that's another advantage of the uh, character, I guess. Yeah. yeah. No, I've always been surprised I haven't gotten like a cease and desist from Mattel or whoever owns Monopoly Man. <laughs> It'd be too much of a liability. I mean, I also, I think it kind of helped the brand a little bit. I think that's mostly why they let me do it. I'm Plus, sure I mean, you know I, I don't think they really have a case, but. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you know, too, that Monopoly was invented as a critique of capitalism, the game. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is why everyone hates playing it. I was just going to say, I have a question for Margaret before we wrap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you running? Sorry? Are you running? running? Are you running in 2024? Oof. <laughs> You know, it's a uh, you know, one to, term female president. Come confirm on. or deny. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I think at the at the end of my first term, I was I was committed to uh, restoring the democratic norms of our constitution and our country, smooth transition of power, right? A peaceful transition of power at the 
a timely value in the United States. And so uh, the people voted for, for Joe Biden and, and Joe Biden is our president. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's too soon at this time to say what might happen in 2024. It is, it is true that, you know, as, as a one-term president, that path remains open to me. But I, I think like so many former presidents, you know, I, I have to think about uh, my legacy, how I can best serve the my country. Brain library, uh, working on my memoirs, you know, all these kinds right, of surfing. important, I, I want to get into that. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I, I do wonder, seriously, have you, has it made you consider running for any kind of office? Oh, good question. Oh, wow. Um, honestly, I've been, I, I, I know elected officials, um, and I've, I've been close enough to that, that it's not something I want to do right now. Um, it's a, it's a really, I like that it's a really it's the profound same answer. answer. You're like, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm running for president right now. Now, Margaret, are you going to run for office? I'm not going to say right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you, why close the door? <laughs> I mean, I get that though. It doesn't seem like a very fun life. I don't know that. It's I a would lot. It's a lot it. of, it's a lot of scrutiny and it's a lot of work when you're, when you're a, a passionate and compassionate person who wants to do a good job, it's a, it's a very serious spot, and the, and the people I know who are who are in elected office take it incredibly seriously, and, I, and I'm very genuinely, unironically, no jokes, like so grateful for their service. Um, yeah, uh, but it's it's a lot. I, I have a six like month old baby. Uh, it's not the time. <laughs> that's fair. I do feel like if you were to run for supervisor, or mayor, or something, though, being like I'm a former president would really give you a leg up. You know. You know, it's it would be an honor to uh, to serve <laughs> in, yeah. in, in, in any capacity. <laughs> that's a good point, Ian, because. You just have to run. You don't have to win. Right. Well, and that's, I mean, that's, we didn't. Uh, it, There's it, a lot of candidates for mayor in San Francisco that I'm not sure plan to win. And just <laughs> equally true now that I live in Oakland. And and I think that, you know, a, a topic for another day is like the incredible history of like women running for president in the United States. Women have been running for president since before we had the right to vote in the United States. Yeah. Let us never forget. <laughs> So, so, you know, in that sense, like there's, there's an incredible legacy, uh, you know, shout out to Eileen Miles, also the first uh, openly female presidential candidate back in the self-declared back, back in the nineties. Um, and uh, there's just, there's so many incredible instances of uh, w women pointing out in a variety of ways, how absolutely inexcusable it is that we continue to be governed uh, solely by men in this country. We're used to it because it's normal. It's bullshit. Uh, it should never be regarded as normal under any circumstances. It makes no sense. It's completely anomalous. Uh, it should not continue. Well put. Also, with, you know, Zelensky in Ukraine, you wouldn't be the first president, too, that first played the president as a character. It can be such qualifying. A, such a good point. <laughs> So look, know, there's like, so many like, different ways to learn to learn the skills needed for the job. Yeah, yeah. I think we need many more like comedians that become presidents. I think that would be great. That's a good pipeline. <laughs> so Ian, are you do you have anything planned? Are are you gonna run the Monopoly man for any office or um he likes to outsource his labor, uh -huh. so yeah. probably not I'll just be buying the politicians. A true capital. Um, Surf on yeah, some corporate we... boards, maybe. Yeah, we we outsource that to the help. We don't do it ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have anything that you're working on that you can speak about? Um, yes, actually, just this week, uh, we released a really incredible video. Honestly, I was the actor in it. I did not produce it, so I can't claim credit for that. But where uh, I, as Monopoly Man, reveal my true face, um, which turns out to be Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, we did a really, really creepily convincing deep fake video that just nice. came out a couple days ago um and apparently zuckerberg has already seen it and been asked about it so that's kind of the exciting thing this week um we're doing a couple actions um related to that basically that are pushing congress to uh pass the american innovation and choice online act which is um kind of trying to rein in big tech's monopoly stop them from self-dealing and self-preferencing um and so that's kind of what I'm pushing this week. We really only have, you know, the next two weeks or so that Democrats have the House to get this passed. And unfortunately, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is actually the guy standing in the way. He has the votes, but he has not brought them to the floor yet. Wow. Are you? Yeah. How hopeful are you? Um, this will come out after whatever happens, happens. 
Oh yeah. I'm not super hopeful. <laughs> um, I, well, I mean, so to, you know, give a little bit of the inside baseball, not only has Chuck Schumer taken $487,000 in campaign donations from big tech companies, oh. um, but his, one of his daughters works at Meta at Facebook oh. and the other daughter is the head lobbyist for Amazon. So oh boy. Oh boy. I, I think that he is holding them up very purposely and I'm, you know, we're obviously trying to get more attention on that, to put pressure on him, but yeah, it's a hard hurdle to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's wild. It's actually like a bipartisan bill. Um, well, it's been great talking to you both. Super fun. Um, I admire what you guys do so much. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, I think some of the key takeaways for me is that this is uh, very possible for us to do and it can be a lot of fun. And finding the right place where it can fit um, can uh, really present a lot of opportunities that I think with both of those projects show just how far uh, things can go. And uh, also the impact that it can have, both with Margaret's project in a, in a more kind of personal, um, interpersonal way, but with Ian's too, and kind of encapsulating the argument that they were trying to make that they weren't getting any traction with before. And then all of a sudden that image helped make it understood. I also, as always, want to encourage you not just to watch these and make some notes and enjoy them, but also to use it. You know, think about is there an issue that you care about or that you're working on now that some of these ideas could apply to and to give yourself this space to experiment. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect the first time. It doesn't have to like be at this massive scale, but like maybe just play around with it and see what happens. So the Center for Artistic Activism is a 5013C nonprofit organization. And we produce these resources and programs, and we try to make them as accessible and affordable and easy uh, uh, to get a hold of as we can. And so that's why we release these entirely free. We don't have a, um, a like a paid tier or something. But uh, we do need support to make them happen. They they uh, take resources. It takes resources to make these resources. So if you are an individual, please consider donating to the center. It, every contribution is meaningful, and I absolutely mean that. Um, if you're an organization and you want to figure out a way of supporting us, we'd love to talk to you. So get in touch. And I also want to quickly thank the Four Doves Foundation and Andrea Soros Columbell, who helped make this series of revolutionizing activism possible. Thanks.